Hello, and welcome back to the Mechanochemistry Discussions. This seminar series is hosted by the NSF-funded Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry, or the CMCC. I'm Ashley Martini. As always, the goal of our seminar series is to bring the community together. Our seminars stream live on the third Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. Central and are available to watch anytime on the YouTube channel. If you've missed any of them, we've had an excellent group of speakers already as part of the seminar series. And again, they're available to watch on the YouTube channel. And we have an excellent slate of speakers lined up for the rest of this year, and we hope you'll join us for all of them. Before we get started, a great big thanks to a few people. First, Dr. James Batiste, the center director, Jennifer Belsick, the center's administrative coordinator, and two CMCC students without whom the seminar series couldn't happen, Quintarius Moore and Noah Sheehan. Thank you so much for joining us ahead of time. Please do subscribe and follow us on Twitter and also at the YouTube channel for our seminar series. Quick note that this seminar is being recorded. If you have any questions, you may email them to us at cmccdiscussions at gmail.com or post them on YouTube. And either way, they'll be propagated to the speaker to be answered at the end of the presentation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Audrey Moores. Dr. Moores is a full professor of chemistry and co-lead of the materials group at the McGill Sustainability Systems Initiative and associate director of the Facility for Electron Microscopy Research at McGill University. She serves as an associate editor for ACS Sustainable Chemistry and Engineering. In 2020, she became a member of the College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists of the Royal Society of Canada, which is the junior body of the equivalent to the Canadian Academy of Science. In 2021, she received the 2021 CSC Canadian Chemistry and Chemical Engineering Award for Green Chemistry. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Audrey Morse. Hey, so um, welcome everybody. It's really a great pleasure to be a part of this uh, CMCC Mechanochemistry Discussion uh, Series. Um, I am really delighted to be here and I want to thank all the organizers, in particular Ashley Martini for inviting me. This is really cool. And I looked at the list of people coming before me, so it's a huge honor to be here. Today I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, the functionalization of polymers and how we could use that in the context of biomass transformation. And uh, we've been working on this a little bit in my group, working with mechanochemistry and aging techniques. And real, I really hope to uh, show you some of that and get uh, a ton of feedback from you as well on this. So my group works at McGill at, um, on the specific topic of sustainable nanomaterials. We've been working in a number of different areas. We have three big poles where on the one end, at the top here, we've been working on uh, synthesizing new materials, nanomaterials and polymers. And some of the themes there are biomass, mechanochemistry. So this is really what I'm going to talk about mostly today. Um, then we've also been working a lot in catalysis, especially using light, magnetic recovery. And then we've also started more recently working at the interface with toxicology and assessment to try to better understand um, the impact of nanomaterials and try to really design novel types of nanomaterials um, for a better future. So if I zoom in onto the biomass question, um, of course, a lot of people have looked into transforming biomass. This is an amazing source of, of molecules. This is really relevant in the context where we try to get away from fossil, but it's also super important because these are beautiful materials that we can valorize for uh, getting access to important key molecules. So there's really two big ways in which you can think about taking advantage of biomass. And one of them has been, and I, I would argue this is the one that's been used the most aggressively, I would say, is to try to take biomass and break it down. So make smaller molecules from it. Uh, so trying to deconstruct biomass and, and, and go to molecules such as fuels or, or different components for, for, for different uh, applications. So you can do that, of course, with this lignocellulosic material. So this mixture of lignin, hemicellulose, and cellulose that you find in plants. And you can do that as well with another kind of, of, of a biopolymer polysaccharide called chitin, which you find in the hexoskeleton of um, crustaceans as well as insects, and also in some fungi. 
But another thing that I think is really interesting is this, this, is this notion that maybe we cannot completely break down the material. Maybe we can take advantage of the fact that we have already existing beautiful polymers. And maybe what we can do is instead of breaking them down with big scissors, trying to paint them a little bit differently and tweak them more gently to try to make functional materials that would, uh, with, with less chemistry, less input, and at the end of the day, build uh, more resilient materials. So that's a little bit what we've been looking into. And uh, in particular, in the context of Quebec, we have uh, a huge Christian waste problem. In, uh, in the world, it's estimated that we produce between six and eight million tons of waste crabs, shrimps, and lobster alone. And uh, this uh, material, of course, is very rich in chitin, and this chitin material has a lot of interesting properties that we can exploit. One thing that I would say in this context as well is that uh, in Quebec in particular, we are a huge uh, producer of, of, of crustacean waste. So we also have really high numbers, high values of, of, uh, of, uh, of crustacean waste to deal with. And, and right now, we don't have a very good solution for that. So um, one thing that you can do with this material is to break it down. And I, what I want to do with you right now is zoom in a little bit into what a crustacean shell is so that we understand a bit what the challenge is uh, as we're trying to valorize it. So you can see here, this is the structure, uh, idealized structure of a crustacean uh, shell. It is composed of four, uh, sorry, three main components. In blue here, you have chitin, which is a polysaccharide containing um, uh, um, amide functionalities. You also have proteins that are laced around this and a lot of minerals as well being present. So what you can do with that is you can actually um, extract the chitin, so remove the minerals and the proteins and recover uh, chitin um, in itself. So this is happening through usually solar chemistry, two steps, it's a little bit uh, intense, but the part that is even more intense when you try to get to chitosan, which is a really interesting materials you can apply to uh, making biomedical applications, making water, water filter, making antibacterial materials. Um, the issue is that you use, you, you need here very corrosive conditions, again, using solar thermal uh, reactions. And this leads to lots of effluents that are difficult to handle. And in the Quebec context, for instance, we used to have a um, factory that was doing it, but it, it's uh, closed down more than 10 years ago because it was not meeting the environmental requirements. So it became really a problem to do that. So one of the ways with which we've, attracted, we've uh, approached this problem has been, okay, let's try to see if mechanochemistry could help us deal with this. And of course, I, you know, this slide, you've, you've seen some versions of this slide several times in this discussion, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Just want to show here the variety of mechanochemical devices that can be used from the ones that we operate manually to the ones that are mechanized to the extrusion. I know you had a really great uh, talk of, uh, on that a few, a few months ago, and also we're using aging, which is another part of, of mechanochemistry whereby you could activate or mix uh, powders together and then, then let them age over time. Of course, mechanochemistry has been uh, named one of the 10 innovation uh, in a uh, few years ago, like uh, three years ago. And uh, it's still really thought in chemistry as being an emerging really important tool for accessing materials. And there's been amazing people. I think your inaugural uh, speaker in the series, Thomas Lafritsch, my, my uh, collaborator here at McGill, uh, he's really an inspiration to us, and he and uh, he's constantly asking questions. And I, and I and I like the way he's really questioning mechanochemistry all the time and saying, "Okay, we we think this is this very harsh um, uh, um, technique that it's delivering a ton of energy." But in fact, through his work, uh, he's seen repeatedly how by really controlling the kind of mechanochemistry he's applying, you can actually have much softer kinds of chemistries happening. And today's theme is really going to be a lot around this. I'm really going to try to show you how you can use mechanochemistry to get the benefit of the less solvent, no solvent kind of idea, which is really critical in, in the case of some of the systems that I'll show. But at the same time, also understand how we can tame it and, and adapt the amount of energy we apply so that we can also be respectful to the, to the molecule in the end. So 
again, developing a number of different, uh, different concepts, just to give you a few uh, tools in your toolbox before we get to the, to the data itself. Um, Tomislav and others have been developing these great liquid assisted grinding concepts. Uh, these are a few, uh, a few examples you can see here. And I'm showing here uh, the, uh, nice, uh, uh, this nice picture of a, of a, of a, of a beach uh, with the waves, because the way we can see liquid assisted grinding is really where we add a little bit of solvent, but the material is still very much in a solid state. The same way you can think about um, not too wet sand, so sand with a little bit of, of water in it and how it still has very much the property of a solid material. So this is uh, some really interesting work and, 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 uh, and people have showed that these really small quantities, usually catalytic quantities of solvents, can really completely change the reactivity, the selectivity of, of a, the different number of materials. It's been exploited in making APIs, for instance. And finally, the last tool that we'll use to so I mentioned it very briefly. I wanted to show here uh, a specific example from, again, a, a great paper from Thomas Love where he's been uh, showing that you could use aging as a way to make moths in this case. And in the chemistry, there is really reminiscent of what lichens are doing. So really trying to use in a solid phase two reagents working together over time. You accelerate the reaction by heating or by using different vapors. And this is, again, a, a solid phase reactivity, but at the same time, something that can really uh, help some reaction to happen, and we'll definitely use that. I'm showing here on the right-hand side a setup that we have for doing this, whereby we're using a Tupperware to create conditions of high humidity, for instance, or high vapors. And at the same time, we can heat this to uh, um, you know, 50 degrees, that kind of things, and really get some chemistry going. OK, so now that we have our backpack full, Let's go back to the question that we had at the beginning. So the biomass question, I mentioned that we were interested in trying to do this approach here. So the approach where we break down molecules is actually one that's very natural to the mechanochemistry uh, community because mechanochemistry has been used quite aggressively in the pulp and paper industry, for instance, or um, as, as a means to actually pre-treat biomass and prepare it for some chemical transformations. This is something that's very well known. People have taken wood, wood chips, and also ground it down. And with different kinds of reactivity, found that it was helping with the subsequent chemical steps that would, would occur. So this is something that we know very well. But again, here, the focus is around how can we break down stuff? How can we make materials smaller and how we can effectively destroy the beautiful structure that we started from. So our approach here and our, what we want to argue is something cool to do is to try to think, okay, can we now use mechanochemistry, but again, understanding better what we're doing, better the energy input. And in this case, try to break down the biomass in a controlled way, or actually not break down the biomass, but just do transformations in a very controlled way and, and try to preserve the backbone that can be really useful so that we get to useful, useful functional materials. So we started working on this a few years ago and, and uh, really uh, got interested in, uh, in, at the beginning, really simple functionalization of, of man-made polymers. So we started with uh, PEG, actually, as a polymer that we use for a different uh, application um, in uh, nanoparticle design. We were really intrigued to see that MPEG seemed to be, uh, when it was functional, a very pricey polymer. So we wanted to see if we could actually uh, make uh, these different uh, functional PEG more accessible uh, from a cost perspective, and thus really thought, you know, maybe it would be good to get rid of the solvent and see if we could get uh, access to good materials. So what was really cool is that we showed that we could uh, introduce five different functionalities with very simple, me purely mechanochemical techniques where we mailed with different compounds, sometimes in a one step, some, sometimes in a two step process. And, and, and really in matters of uh, uh, an hour, an hour and a half access, interesting functionalities such as introducing a leaving group, a, to a tosyl leaving group here at the end of the MPEG, a bromine, a thiol, I would say here the thal was really interesting because one of the caveats of the solution method here is the dimerization of the thiol into, uh, um, into disulfide, which is not something that we observed 
and its superiority actually of this methodology over solution. Um, and uh, we were also able to introduce carboxylic acid as well as an amine. So that was really cool. And, and we used here a vibrational mill, which um, arguably is not too harsh as a method because we didn't see that we damaged the polymer itself, broke any CO or CC bond. And uh, again, we didn't have these effects of uh, dimerization that we can have sometimes in these systems in, in solution. So that was really, really interesting. And in, an, in a different research area uh, that was research done by Alain Lee a few years ago, who was developing some hydrogenation method by mechanochemistry, originally for small molecules. But then he was really intrigued to say, hey, how about we take something that's really insoluble, something where it would really make sense to do it by mechanochemistry. And he found that with his technique, which was completely metal free, um, uh, he could actually uh, um, introduce uh, hydrides from uh, the uh, material from the silane industry here, PMHS, uh, which is a solid source of hydride. So that's really also interesting and, and conducive to mechanochemistry. He could do this transformation of polyketones to partially hydrogenated polyketones. He had about a 50% yield, which was really interesting because it started to change the actual properties of this uh, thermoplastic polymer and make it, made it more soluble into polar solvent. So that was something that we we thought again was interesting and again something where we, we saw that the polymer resisted the condition fairly well. And the last example that we did a bit more recently was, uh, this is where we started to look into biomass a bit. We tried to do, uh, to introduce phosphate esters functionality onto alcohol bearing uh, um, polymers such as again PEG, MPEG, uh, polyvinyl alcohol or polyvinyl chloride. So we could introduce it here to the, to the chloro. And it also worked with cellulose nanocrystals. So this is a specific kind of, of, of cellulose. I'll come back to it a bit later in the talk. But just essentially here, the gist of it is that this method is very robust, very versatile. It works on any alcohol group. And again, has limited effect on the polymer structure itself, really you know, showing that this could be a very valid method. Again, what's really cool when you talk about polymer we don't need to worry about solubility. We don't need to worry about mixing it uh, with, a, you know, having a solvent that's compatible at the same time with the polymer and with the reagents that you want to add. You cut on the workup and so on. So this is really something that we thought was really cool. So we, what we learned doing this is that mechanochemistry actually against the maybe perception is actually very good for polymer functionalization and it respects the polymer. So going back to our question of crystalline waste, we were like, okay, what can we do in order to help with this problem? So when we started working on this, uh, there had been a, a bit of work that was done prior to us by really uh, two great trailblazers, uh, Ning Yan and Frank Curtin, um, who had uh, thought about trying to break down chitin into, uh, into, uh, into essential components, and in particular, transform chitin into chitazan, which is this really interesting polymer. And in this context, they used uh, uh, this technique to uh, do the, the mechanochemical route, uh, which will be, uh, again, more resilient than the solution-based one, which you can see at the top. But what's interesting here is that in this context, they were really looking into using, I would say, a bit harsh mechanochemistry techniques, because in this case, they were trying to get to low molecular weight chitosan. So this molecule here, and even get to the glucosamine component of, uh, of, uh, of, of chitin, uh, which you can see here, again, by a mechanochemical uh, technique, breaking down the chitin into, into, uh, into that. And that was really inspirational for us because we, we said, okay, mechanochemistry is cool. It does the chemistry of the transformation here of this amide group into this amine group that you can see here, which is uh, the uh, characteristic of chitazan. But we wanted to get it further and say, okay, how about we try to make this uh, with a higher molecular weight? So how about we try to preserve the backbone and not get you know, the chitin or chitazan chopped off? So this is what we proceeded to do. And we proceeded with this two-step method whereby we first take chitin and amorphize it 
on the mechanochemical condition. In this case, there's no extra reagents. And what this does is that it really gently amorphizes the chitin. Um, it's not possible to measure the molecular weight of chitin, so we don't know if we're really not doing a little bit of breaking down, but, but we think that it's not really affecting the chitin structure much more than just disrupting its crystalline environment. And then what we do is we do a very short milling with sodium hydroxide, which is the reagent typically used to do the transformation of, of the chitin, which is this uh, amide group here into the amine group here uh, that you have on this side. And uh, so we do this only for five minutes, because again, if we expose it too long under these conditions, we might start to do a bit more than just the deacetylation. We must start to break this glycosylic bond there. And then key to this chemistry, in order for this to react, we need to leave it for a few days at high humidity. And we can vary the temperature from room temperature to 50 degrees. We could get more or less reactivity. But at the end of the day, we obtain um, chitosan with very high degree of deacetylation, which is the you can see here. This just means the number of uh, amide groups that were transformed into amines. And in the end of the day as well, we obtain systems with very high viscosity, which are indicative that we have much higher um, molecular weights than the ones that you, you saw earlier. So that's what I showed you. And what we were able to do as well is to validate that we could do this transformation with a number of different sources. So what we did in this example is we actually took crushed uh, crustacean shell directly and validated we could do the deacetylation and make chitosan, of course, you also have these other components that I mentioned that are still present, so it's not really realistic, but at least it means that they're not hindering the reactivity. So that was, that was good. And we also validated that we had really good metrics. So for instance, this is the energy used in different kinds of mechanochemistry and thermal techniques. You can see here the thermal in yellow. Any mechanochemical scenario will use far less energy, uh, like less than five times less energy than the one we use. For silver thermal. So that's something that we thought was interesting. We also gain on the material. So we add less sodium hydroxide, about an order of magnitude less, and less water as well throughout the process, which is, again, you'll remember, very key for making this a uh, commercial system. OK, so going back to this, at the beginning, I showed you that you could use the shells, turn them into chitin by extracting them, removing minerals and proteins, and then turning chitin into Chitosan, we showed that we could do in high molecular weights. Others like Curtin and Ning showed you could access chitosan directly as well by mechanochemistry. So I think there's lots to do. We still have a lot of work to do in this realm to control the molecular weight. So that's something that uh, we're still working on. Um, but the thing that we wanted to pay attention to is actually this uh, chitin to, to uh, sorry, crystallization shell to chitin and understand if there was a way that we could actually extract chitin as well with by mechanochemistry and without the use of a solution system. So in order to do this, we partnered with folks in Parks Canada in a really beautiful park called Kejim Kujik Park. And these guys came to us because they had a very big problem in this place that you can see here on the Nova Scotia coast, about uh, an hour and a half away from Halifax here on the coast. It's a beautiful place where they have a, a really well-preserved natural park and an, a beautiful estuary um, um, ecosystem. They have a big problem, which is called green crab. So these guys here, they uh, invaded this estuary that you can see here in the background from, from Chris. And uh, they actually destroy the ecosystem. They, they cut eelgrass, which means that it destroys the habitat of a bunch of different naturally occurring uh, um, crustaceans and fish. And it's also a problem for migratory birds. And they had really, it had inv invaded the entire place. So uh, at Parks Canada, under the initiative of Chris and Gabriel, they developed a technique to trap specifically these green crabs and retrieve them from the ecosystem. And doing that, they've been able to recover big chunks of, uh, of, uh, of the estuary uh, ecosystem. So they're really, uh, re really doing a fabulous job. And a lot of people who have the same problem on the East Coast and the, South, and, uh, and the West Coast as well of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Americas, North America, 
uh, are now coming to them and say, how, how do you do this? Because we have the same problem. So this is really cool. So this is uh, the estuary that you can see here. This is actually when we went there. This is my, my daughter that you can see here in very small. And these are, I don't know if it's going to work, but I show the, the little video there. Um, maybe if I do this, you can see here the green crabs are really very energetic, full of, uh, full of life. And uh, in, uh, in uh, the afternoon there, we collected like several hundreds of them. So it's kind of a lot. You can see them here. Uh, and, uh, and, and what Parks Canada wants to do is to actually try to, um, to find resources so that they can transform it into something that they can sell. So they come to us and they say, hey, can you help us do something with it? You know how to turn it into kaitazen, but can you take them from, from, the, from the, the shell itself? So we were funded through uh, different uh, people, through the Fathom Fund and, and the Seeds of Change. What, uh, what's really cool there is that Seeds of Change is a, is a um, crowdfunding platform. So we actually had to get this funding to get actually a, uh, a campaign on social media and crowdfund the, the money. So that was really cool to do. And, and that, that's how we got the money to, to do this work. So, to come back to this problem, we have this complicated structure. We need to remove the minerals and the proteins. The traditional method applies again two steps with uh, a basic and then an acidic treatment. Some people have developed ionic liquid versions of that, deep eutectic versions of that. You have people who've developed bacterial systems. All of them are really cool, but they're not really addressing the big issue, which is we need to lower the solvent use because this is really key. It's really the, 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 the edge that needs to be broken so that these things are applied more. So uh, uh, Faiza and then later on Juliana joined the team. There were more people working on this as well. Uh, and uh, they've started to uh, devise a method to take the green crabs that we received like whole and frozen and uh, turn them into, into shells and then using that as our starting material, we've been able to, uh, sorry, we've been able to then uh, develop a um, mechanochemistry based method where we use pure mechanochemistry by mixing here uh, shells with different organic acids and found that we obtain extremely good levels of the uh, demineralization and deproteinization. So how do we know that? So here in green, you can see the curve, the TGA thermogravimetric curve of the green crab shell. So you can see here that the proteins first get uh, killed by the, the thermal treatment. Then there's a step here that corresponds to chitin. So you see there's not a huge amount of chitin in green crab. It's not a crustacean that contains a huge amount of chitin. And then later on, you see uh, different uh, edges here that correspond to minerals. So when we use a traditional method, we can essentially get rid of the protein and get rid of the minerals. So we have a nice edge here at, this, at the, the temperature of chitin. And we validated that with these different acids, especially malic acid is very efficient. We have a nice edge. So we do not have, again, the presence of proteins and, uh, and minerals. And we were able to extract uh, the uh, uh, chitosan, uh, sorry, the chitin with excellent yields of 16%. Uh, so this is 16% over the whole mass. So when you see that we had to extract this small step here, it's actually really close to being 100% of what we could extract. So this is really cool. And we also have a low ash content, which is something really important for future use. That's, that's indicating the residual mineral that are present there. And, and one, one percent, so one to two percent is a really good region to be for that. So we're really excited about this. And, uh, and this is something that we're going to continue to develop because we, we really want to, to hopefully partner with people locally to, uh, to be able to use that in real scale and really uh, help people there. So more recently as well, we've been also thinking about going towards uh, a bit more higher end functional materials. And one of the spin that you can take on this is to actually look at uh, a type of material called nanocrystallites. So um, where, uh, so I, I mentioned here that you could take your crustacean shell, extract them and turn them into chitin and then transform them into chitosan. I mentioned that we could do that by mechanochemistry. That's all cool. 
But then uh, the chitin itself is actually highly crystalline and has these structures here that looks like little crystals. And what you can do is you can actually selectively kill these little linkers there and actually release these crystals, which are materials with really cool properties. So one issue though, is that once you have the nanochitin, you'd like often to get to the nanochitosan because chitosan has better properties. It's antibacterial, it's a really uh, suspendable in solution. So that's a nice system. But unfortunately, when you deacetylate it, you also tend to break the crystallinity of the system. So you make nanoparticle stuff, but not very well-defined ones. So the first question that we had is, can you actually go uh, from nanochitin to kind of nanochitosan itself? And, um, and that's a question that when we started working with this, and especially with our partner Edmund Lam at NRC, we didn't know that it could be addressed. So just a quick, uh, quick thing on the nanocrystal. So the nanocrystal is something that's uh, general, again, to uh, biomass and uh, any kind of biomass, whether this is lignocellulosic of chitin, you have in these uh, native sources, uh, different hierarchical structures all the way to the nanocrystallite itself, which is this elongated whisker uh, structure here, which constitute the fibers of chitin or cellulose. And with strong acid hydrolysis, you can actually break down this material and, 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 and get these nice whiskers that you can observe here by electron microscopy. So these materials are now really exciting and, and, and really exciting a lot of people, sorry. Uh, the, the nanocellulose in particular is one that's really taking the forefront. You see here a plant that was built in Quebec to make ton per day scale uh, nanocellulose. There are 10 different plants around the world that are at different uh, stages of pilot versus uh, commercial for nanochitin. It's got some cool properties. It's got some thixotropic properties. It's got some... Uh, optical properties so it's used in photonics. So there's lots of cool applications that are being developed. But again, the question is, can you do that with nanochitin and with nanochitosan? and there's far less work on this. So the transition from chitin to nanochitin had been done before, but Edmund here developed really mild method using uh, APS, ammonium persulfate, as a method for turning chitin into nanochitin. And then uh, using, uh, 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 a chemistry around sodium hydroxide, uh, they were able to also turn it into nanochitosan. One disclaimer that I need to make here is that this is one of the few slides where we're going to use solution-based methods. So this is all done in solution. This is not mechanochemistry. This is work that my partner Edmund Lamb did at NRC and shared with us so that we could make some applications. So that was really cool stuff. And they were able for the first time to make nanochitosan by really tweaking the method and using, especially reducing, uh, reducing agents that will sort of limit the depolymerization to obtain these really nice nanochitosan materials. So this was published a couple of years ago. And then we applied this to various catalytic reactions with gold. We also worked a bit with palladium. I'm not gonna talk too much about that, but if you're interested, you can, you can have a look at, at this paper. Um, but one thing that we wanted to know is that, okay, I've showed you everything. So this is done by solvothermal. This is done by solvothermal. Now the question we had is, can we turn it to mechanochemistry? Because that would be, again, really cool in terms of saving on, these, uh, on, on the cost of making these nanomaterials. So this is where uh, Tony and Tracy stepped in and they developed this mechanochemical reaction for the transformation of chitin nanocrystals into uh, chitosan nanocrystals. What we could demonstrate here is that we could preserve the nanocrystalline structure. Another thing that was really cool as compared to the solution-based method is that we could retain higher crystallinities throughout the system, which made our rods at the end much more robust. So adapting this, we looked into uh, making gels. And what we've done with that is um, we validated that we could uh, uh, we actually had nanocrystals that could uh, form nice gels with alginate. And these are uh, rheology uh, um, results that were showing actually that the gelation was extremely high. So in this case, it was just mixing the alginate with the nanochitosan. And when we did this, we observed really high uh, gelation capacity, which is really indicative of uh, the robustness of the system. 
Um, the last thing that we did with that is to do a drug release with alginates and calcium uh, and, uh, and, and calcium. So in this case, we made a, a system based on the nanocrystals you can see here in red, the alginates and calcium. And we unstrapped the bovine serum albumin as a model for a drug. And we showed that this time it was a sovothermal made nanokytosan that was actually the most efficient and affording the slowest release with the drug. Really, again, uh, really competitive with what, with what was out there, really a much lower release and uh, something that was really interesting. So we could, with that, understand how mechanochemistry and, and solvothermal method could go hand in hand and really tweak the properties of, of gels that we can make from them. So uh, what I've been showing you today is how we can make chitin to chitosan by mechanochemistry while retaining large molecular weights. We could also do the, trans the deprotonization and demineralization of, of crustacean to chitin. How we could also do similar stuff for the nanochitin to nanochitosan and how we could apply these in different applications in catalysis and, and for gels as well. So I have to thank a bunch of people. I'm really focusing on really the, the recent members of the group who've done a lot of work there. So Tony and Tracy, who've done all the nice uh, gel uh, properties that uh, I uh, last showed. Uh, Shuabing is uh, from the group of my collaborator, Jen Yu Lee, who's working more on the uh, rheology properties. And Faiza and Juliana have worked in the team as well, more on the, on the side of the, of the transformation of um, uh, a crustacean shell into, into chitin. I'm also grateful to my collaborators in Mount Lam and De De David Kurdila, who have been really uh, great partners and uh, putting uh, us on on the putting us on the on the on the scent for the the work on the on the, um, nanochitin and nanochitosan. So I want to thank a bunch of people and all the funding that we've received so far on these projects. We're really really excited about this work and. Uh, and um, that's uh, what I wanted to show today. So I would like to really thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I hope if you have any question that I'll be able to address them. So thank you so much for uh, being here today. All right, thank you. We have a few questions from the audience. Early in the presentation, you mentioned accelerated aging. Are there any concerns about the reaction pathways being different when the reactions are accelerated through this process? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great point. And this is one that uh, um, I think people in this area are trying to address a bit better. So when uh, Thomas Laff first published this, uh, this paper in 2012, I believe on uh, accelerated aging, he coined it accelerated aging because compare, compared to a reaction that happens, for instance, in nature, where lichen over years is going to uh, dissolve very, very gradually with uh, organic acids, a rock, this takes years, right? So by accelerating it, by heating the reaction, he actually mimics that reactivity, but in a much reduced uh, time scale. So that's why he called it accelerated. I guess with our work, we're starting to go more into, uh, into reactivities that had not been done in the solid phase really, or not, not reported, I guess. So we've been calling it simply aging because you know we don't really have a point of reference here to call it accelerated aging. But in the context of comparing, for instance, what happens with, uh, with on, on lichen versus uh, a, a reproduced thing in the lab, I think this is a very valid question. Uh, I don't know that we've done anything ourselves to address this question right away, but I think that this is really something, something that people want to look into more for sure. Thank you. On one of the slides, you mentioned <clears throat> that, the, that the milling involves stainless steel jar and balls. Have you tried any other materials or can you predict what the effect would be of using other materials for the jar or the balls or both? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a paper that I'm not citing here, which is a Belstein GOC in a special edition of mechanochemistry where we've been actually um, looking at the effect of various materials over the reaction. So we use different metals, we use stainless steel, we use zirconia, and we use also different plastics. And what we, so in the context of the chitin to chitosan transformation, we really studied specifically amorphization of chitin. And we found that the key there was the uh, hardness of the material. So if it had a hardness higher than chitin, 
then it would destroy chitin and its, its uh, crystalline structure. If it was lower, it would essentially not do very much. We could not really see any other effect from the metal for, but again, here we really mostly observed a, a crystalline to amorphous uh, transition. Um, there's beautiful work that's done by uh, James Mack, for instance, where he's using actually quite creatively the walls of this material and the balls as, as a catalyst. So, so these are cases in which it really matters to pick the right thing. Uh, in our case, we were concerned that using an AOH, the stainless steel could be uh, damaged over years, especially under uh, intense wear condition that we have in mechanochemistry. So we turned to zirconia jars to, just to make sure we had something a bit better. Uh, we did observe a bit of contamination by stainless steel, but um, yeah, so that these are the kinds of considerations that we make when we pick our, our material. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the slides mentioned that the mechanochemical reaction used much less energy in water, and it was noted yeah. that the energy was five times lower, which was impressive. Yeah. Can you tell us how you quantify that energy difference? Because yeah. there's a lot of different energy sources in both approaches. Yeah, exactly. And this is something that we're really interested in because, uh, so I'm, I'm an associate editor for a, a journal, ACS Sustainable, that I encourage to read and to, to apply your, your research, uh, to apply, um, submit your papers to. Uh, this, uh, this journal has really tried to develop more metrics and, and encourage people to use more metrics. I think this is really important in chemistry that we're able to say it's greener or it's better, you know, when we really have data to show that. So we've not done it systematically for all the work I showed, but the more recent work we're trying to always give really rigorous metrics of yields, of mass balance, of, of uh, PMI, so process mass intensity and energy. So for the energy specifically, what we do is we bought these very cheap uh, energy meters that you have in, uh, in the store. And we just run the system with this on. So we just, you know, push the buttons and measure how much energy happened. And we use this as our metric. So it's not perfect, of course, because when you want to extrapolate that to a larger scale, of course, your little um, heat plate is really not designed to be very energy efficient. So we compare it this way, right? So I guess the mechanochemical device we have in the lab are a bit better equipped for energy, you know, for, from the standpoint of energy than our heat plates in our lab are. Um, so with that caveat, this is where maybe we inflate a little bit the goodness of our system, but it is, it is nonetheless delivering uh, the result with less energy from that perspective. So that's how we measure it. Great. All right. I think we have time for just one more. Um, you mentioned the comparison between cellulose and chitin, and there's certainly been quite a bit more work on cellulose. Are there advantages to using chitin? over cellulose, if this could be scaled up? Yeah, it's a really good point. Thanks a lot for asking this question. So um, when we go to chitin, we have access to chitosan, which is the material that I talked a lot about. And chitosan is a charged material because it has the amine functionality, it can very easily be protonated and uh, at pH 6, 6 and lower, it's going to be a charged species. And both at the nanocrystalline version and in the polymer version, it means we have very suspendable, very soluble material, which cellulose equivalents are not. So it really changes a lot of the properties you can have. And in addition, it comes with additional benefits. So nanochitosan and chitosan are highly antibacterial. So they can have applications in the biomedical realm for that reason. So, and also the, the um, you know, the fact that you have an amine is also a port of entry to uh, future functionalization that cellulose doesn't have. So these are some of the reasons why we think it's interesting to do that. All right, great. Well, thank you for those questions and thank you again for participating in the seminar series. Thank you so much, Ashley, and thank you to the team as well. Outstanding presentation. And thank you so much for joining us. If you've missed any of our seminar speakers, we encourage you to check them out on the YouTube channel at CMCC Mechanochemistry Discussions. Also, we look forward to having you join us for all of our future seminar speakers. Thank you again.